Signed by Busy.co. David Newell, welcome to the Small Business Collaboration Summit. It is good to be with you. Thanks again. So international speaker, advisor to multinational clients, large corporations, uh, an author of several best-selling books, including Relationship Economics, and this gem of a book, Co-Create. Now, this is your 10th book, and this is actually the book that really prompted me to contact you. I only needed to read the first chapter to really feel that I had found my collaboration soulmate. <laughs> I couldn't put it down. And, and I really wanted to say to uh, all the business owners that are watching this interview, it doesn't matter what industry sector you're in, where you're located, uh, and how big or small your business is, you really need to read this. It will absolutely blow your mind. I, I need more friends like you. That, that's the only <laughs> response I can tell. No, jo joking aside, um, so yes, Co-Create is book number 10. Mm. And the more I work with a lot of different types of clients across a lot of different industries, the more it jumped out this is not a company or an industry issue or even a geographic issue. These are, are very common themes that I've seen different size companies and teams and organizations struggle with. So what I capture in, in my books hopefully have broad appeal and you're right. If, if, if any of your audience members are trying to genuinely, authentically, effectively collaborate with others, to elevate themselves, their teams, their companies, this might be a decent recipe book for how to do that. So before I ask my first question, I need you to virtually sign my book for me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, obviously you are evangelizing, and I love that word, evangelizing collaboration to your clients. So you talk the talk. Uh, which obviously means you need to walk the walk in your own business. So really, how is collaboration added to your own business growth? Sure. So let me take a step back and mm -hmm. reinforce to you and your, your, yeah. your, your audience members that I've always believed collaboration for sake of collaboration is a waste of time. We're all busy. We're pulled in a lot of different directions. Conversely, if that collaboration makes the end result stronger, if it makes it dramatically better, not incremental, but exponentially better, then it's priceless. So in my own business, uh, this is crazy. This is year 16 of my business. And early on, I promised myself two things. I wouldn't be a pull string speaker, consultant, expert. I don't know if you've seen this type, but you put them on stage, you pull the string, and you kind of hear the same thing over <laughs> and over again. And, and I promised myself that I wouldn't get bored. So but if you just take those two, every uh, couple of years, uh, I create a new S-curve. And if your audience is not familiar with the S-curve, uh, you, you start investing in an idea. It's actually a downward slope because you're, you're investing in it, but you're not making any money from it until it kind of gets traction and it starts to kind of leap. And, and at some point, you're going to reach a plateau and then actually starts to dip. Well, and that's just a natural progression of ideas or new products or services. And the, the astute investors uh, have that next investment kind of going as, as, as the first one is really doing well. So as it starts to peak, the next one is hitting its stride. So you're constantly are reinventing yourself. And, and some of the ideas you read in the book, I also deeply believe in and I talk to others about, which is a mentor drove into me. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And, you know, none of us have all the answers. None of us, you know, have, know it all, have it all. So um, there are several services in my own practice that I've created in the last several years where it said it's, it's genuinely co-created. Uh, and, and specifically, strategy visualization comes to mind. In the book, you saw several uh, examples of visual mm -hmm. strategies for Hilton and KPMG and ThyssenKrupp and several other global clients. Well, I do the strategy part, but I have a creative director that does the visual. And it's a classic case of yin and yang. You really need both of them, and neither one of us could do that effectively. Strategy visualization was a third of my revenues this past year. And it was something I wasn't doing two, three years ago. So it's an example of 
not a partnership, not an alliance, but genuinely a co-created service that I talk about in the book. That's one thing we really talk about at Busy. We have a lot of solopreneurs and we really do try to highlight how you can start to create new product offerings by finding complementary other solopreneurs to really team up with to create something that's bigger than you that can take you in totally new directions. That's exactly right. And, and again, uh, we all have our core strengths. Uh, find others who bring their core strengths and together one plus one equals 11. Mm. So together we've been able to create a unique service that sets me and, and my you know, partner apart from the others in the market. And it's, it's a value to, to, to the target audience. Uh, and especially for solo practitioners, it's really hard to, you know, get creative in an office where you work by yourself, right? And, and, uh, and, and to do that, to proactively uh, uh, seek out others for this kind of collaboration is really critical for all of us growing. And, and just FYI, in the past, we've always talked about, you know, three ways of adding new products or services. You could buy it, you can partner for it, you can build it, Right. Uh, buy it can get expensive. Partner for it, you, you lose some control and it becomes a little more challenging. And, and, and you know, build it, that just takes time. And in this market, agility and speed matters. So I would submit that co-create is really that fourth opportunity where both sides really have a vested interest in seeing this thing get somewhere. You highlight a lot of great examples of successful collaborations in the book, as well as challenges that businesses had had around adopting a, a more collaborative mindset in your own business is there one collaboration that you've been involved with that you're most proud of whether it's been advising a client or even for your own business instead of a, um, a specific engagement or project what i'm most proud of is the way i've started approaching client engagement so my process of finding work delivering that work and really leveraging that work for either subsequent work with that client or additional work elsewhere. So as you can imagine and appreciate, um, most solo practitioners, we walk in and we tell our clients, you sit there, you be quiet, let me tell you how smart I am, right? And let me tell you how good for you I am. Um, I, I've really taken a step back and, and I do a lot of due diligence, again, before I ever engage that, that prospective client, but I walk in with, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Mm -hmm. and, and how could we do this together? And what would that look like? And, and I got to tell you, some of my best work this last couple of years have been solutions that we, we genuinely came up with together. Mm -hmm. And I love it when, and, and I tell people that I'm better uh, on my feet with a whiteboard or an easel. And, and, and my favorite client sessions is where we just kind of, whiteboard what we're thinking of and when the client takes the marker from you and starts to draw on that same board I love that because now they get a sense of buy-in and and now it becomes our joint effort not just here's an outsider that's coming in and telling you how to do this so um, yeah my approach to finding opportunities my approach to engaging prospective clients my approach to delivering value to them and then, you know, again, I, I spent early part of my career at one of the big consulting firms and that business model is get in and stay as long as you can and bill as much as you can and, and bring a lot of people in. And I said, I don't want to do that. So, so my typical engagements are, are about two, three months. And, and my goal is to get in, get the work done and get out. And if you do a good job, those who get it, will bring you back. We'll want to continue to work with you. So one client I've worked with for three years, another one I've been working with for about four or five years, another one uh, has hired me now several times in different, different positions. Um, so again, collaboratively before, during, and after is probably mo what I'm most proud of. And that kind of leads, I think, quite nicely into the concept of market gravity. Mm. for yourself you know that the more you embrace collaboration the more you deliver effectively the greater trust you build therefore the more businesses will want to work with you and so collaboration and that approach really brings its own momentum so so two quick points again for your audience um uh, uh as you have re read or will read in the book i often talk about you know we're, we're inundated with push marketing push advertising push management 
push leadership, push, 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 and we're just, you know, we become desynthesized to it and we avoid it at all costs. Then I ask people, have you ever tried pushing a rope? Well, it just, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> Conversely, you know, we, we think of what we tend to, you know, be gravitate, we gravitate towards. What do we, what do we seek? Are things that are interesting to us, things that we want to learn more about, things that, that intrigue us. And again, I, I heard this term from a mentor, Alan Weiss, years ago, this idea of market gravity. And as I researched it more for the book, if you, and I know none of us are in the ice cream business, but if you give people a taste of your unique value add, you leave them wanting more. And those who get it, those who, and, and also, I, by the way, the other thing I've stopped doing the last couple of years, I've stopped trying to convince people. I think, I think way too many of us try to convince people. And, and I, listen, I, I, we can't help everybody. I don't think none of us are a right fit for everybody. So, you know, if you, if you focus your efforts on a fewer people that really get it, get you, get your unique value add, and you're a right fit for what they're trying to do, I just think we'll all be more successful. There's plenty of business out there for all of us. Mm-hmm. It's just way too many people try to be everything to everybody. And I just, I've never seen that succeed. So if you narrow your focus, if you create, plant that seed, plant that interesting, engaging seed and, and leave them wanting more, you create gravity. So um, uh, I teach uh, an executive education course at, a, at Emory University, uh, two days, uh, you know, 20, 30 executives come and a handful will reach out and say, hey, love the class, we'd love your help and now come in and help us you know, solve very similar problems. That's all I need. That's all I'm really interested in. So, yes, again, the right kind of collaboration, the um, right mixture of unique talents, unique services, complementary services toward what in the book I talk about a common mission, common vision, or potentially common enemy like overregulation um, can really help you elevate yourself, elevate your business to a very different level. So obviously, a good collaboration strategy can provide almost unlimited growth to a small business. Uh, so what do you think? You mentioned some of them. What are the key elements of a successful, sustainable collaboration strategy? I am getting to a, a, a – a, you, you, you may not realize this, but I'm actually 95. I look fantastic for 95, but I'm 95 years old, and I'm losing this hair. Wisdom. This is the wisdom we're getting now, right? Right. You lo- I'm losing hair at an accelerated pace, right? But I'm getting to an age – where the people I work with are just as critical as the quality of the work that we do together, as it is the kinds of projects that we work on. And I'm getting to a place where I just, life's too short to come to work. Again, especially as a solo practitioner and hate, if you hate sitting down at this desk and doing what you do day in and day out, newsflash, you should go do something else. So my number one and I love your comments, sustainable collaboration strategies. Number one, do I like the people I'm collaborating with? Would I, would I invite them to my home for dinner? And if the answer is no, I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> Just no thanks. Um, number two, uh, as I said, one plus one has to equal 11. Is the collaboration going to create um, incremental value add or exponential? So I'm looking for that exponential growth an opportunity, not just, hey, I'm a little bit better off. That's number two. Number three, I learned years ago that one-offs will kill you. If, if you do anything once, that's just way too painful and ton of time and effort. And right? So I'm looking for scalability. And I've always learned, think big, start small, find a way to scale. So our collaboration ideally is, is working on a big opportunity Let's, let's start small. Let's figure out a way to kind of get this piece right. And if this piece works, then we'll figure out a way to scale it. So right now, I can think of four or five initiatives. I'm building a co-create assessment based on the book. And by the way, I learn as much if not more about my own books after they come out because people quote you back to you. And you're like, wait, did I really say that? Um, so we're building a co-create assessment. And I'm partnering with a company that does that piece phenomenally well. And, and the stuff we've come up with, I'm even surprised by, wow, that could be really cool if we could pull that off. Uh, we're building some technology to bring co-create um, and co-creation training 
uh, all very visual to two different target audiences. Again, I'm developing that with with a with a with a couple of people that are just brilliant at what they do. Uh, this strategy visualization is taking off in a, in a big big way. Um, the next book uh, I've got is crazy that you mentioned. I published ten books. I've got seven more in my head in various stages, and I've got them mapped in front of me. And uh, the next the next book, I'm really excited about collaborating with somebody I've known, you know, a former client of mine for 15 years, and we've we've come at the same place from very different walks of life. So any of those, as you can see, big ideas, let's start small, let's figure out a way to scale. I like the people, we're dramatically better off in working together and it will create a, a lasting impact both in my business as well as the business of my clients. Now you talk about uh, innovation a lot in your book and really uh, do emphasize that if you are a business looking to create a new product or an offering, uh, you really need to, and this was my favorite phrase in the book, listen loudly to your customers, to your clients, and, and not just create for creating sake, but really create because there is a need and you've yeah. had that feedback. Yeah. So I wonder if you just can, can describe what listen loudly is and even how that has framed all this new innovation that you're doing now with all these new sure. products. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would submit, I, and again, I'm a big believer that we're products of the advice we take. Think about it a second. We're products of the advice we take. And, and a mentor drove into me years ago that there's money in those notes. I was like, wait, what? He said, as you, as you think about ideas, as you attend conferences, as you listen to this podcast or this interview, there's money in those notes that you take. The challenge is we're not as intentional about extracting the value that we absorb on a daily basis. So several years ago in my coaching work, I was coaching an executive and I just said, listen, I think it would be really useful to you if you listen louder. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you seem to be distracted. You seem to have uh, a lot of, a lot of, and I just recorded the video on this for our regular newsletter, a lot of mental activities going on. You're just, you're thinking about a lot of different things or, or we have a need to have an immediate response to something. And all of those things are really taking away from us effectively listening. And, and I often talk about listen, you know, people say read between the lines I often talk about listen between the lines, right? So whether it's nonverbal communication, whether it's clarity of intent, what do they mean when they say something? Um, there are nuggets all around us. And if you create a collection mechanism for yourself, for me, I take notes diligently. I, I record um, a, a lot of ideas and I go back and listen to them. Uh, when I come back from a conference, I don't schedule anything the next morning. So all I do is go back and synthesize my notes. What did I hear? What were really highlights of this conference or event for me? Um, I speak 50, 60 times a year at events. I often go early or I try to stay afterwards just to listen to other presenters. And you, you, you never know when you're going to pick up a nugget or an idea from somebody else. So these are all examples of proactive learning beyond reading, beyond all the stuff that I think most of us can do that I think will help you, uh, and I call them uh, faint signals, right? There's faint market signals all around us. If you build relationships as signal scouts who can bring these ideas to you, if you listen louder, it really allows you to capture some nuggets and then hopefully start integrating those into your work, start thinking, how could I be better? How could my clients, my relationships be better from product or services that I incorporate from all these ideas that I've captured? And really a theme that I do see in the book is what you've just alluded to, especially when you do speak to clients that um, are consumed possibly with a particular idea or have a rigid view of something, that you almost need to let go of what you are doing or what you currently think you know and think you know best to be able to absorb a new way of doing something sure, sure. around co-creation. Sure. So, so you brought up innovation, and I got to tell you, that's a sexy topic that everybody wants to talk about, and even sexier than that is disruption, and, and I think most people are really struggling how to do that, right? It's, it's, and we're all 
we're all, whether you're a solo practitioner or a large company, we all get very good at building this box, this perfect execution box. I know how to do it. I can do it 50 times and I know the results I can create. As a matter of fact, that's where efficiency effectiveness comes from, right? Mm -hmm. So in the book, I talk about um, the stair step of iteration is doing the same thing better. Innovation is doing new things. Disruption is doing new things that makes the old obsolete. So if you really become focused on iteration, how do I keep doing things better? Again, as a solo practitioner or with your clients, how do we do the same thing better? You'll stumble into innovation, which is now how do we do things differently? How do we do new things you do enough new things and you'll soon realize the way we used to do them just doesn't make sense anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. And that's the real opportunity for disruption. So what I'm learning again after the book has come out is that there's no shortage of ideas, whether you're a solo practice or in a company. I mean, everybody has ideas. The real delineation between those who have the ideas and those who implement them, those who get value from implementing new ones is that they're very disciplined, and, and the audience needs to hear this, in killing 999 flowers so you can focus on the best one. And that is as much of a discipline. So as much of the, the mindset of stop doing, right? So, so and, I, and I've done that myself this past year. Um, I, again, I've got a list of all kinds of stuff that I bet on, like a lot of small bets that I started that I've killed a lot of them because you know what? They didn't, and they were good ideas, but you know what? Only by getting rid of a lot of ideas can I then focus on the best ones. And that's what a lot of individuals, teams, and organizations really struggle in doing. And the discipline isn't there that just because we can doesn't mean we should. And like I said, let's get rid of a lot. Or put them you know, back burner, put them on pause, put them on hold. The investment is sunk cost. Put that aside. So you can really focus in on one, two of the best ones. And that is a discipline. And you actually give a warning earlier on in, in the book. Uh, to basically, you've said your company can either enter the co-create economy willingly or face being sidelined by the companies that do. So it's quite an early warning in the book. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, see it, I see it all the time, right? And, and again, it, this, is, this is pretty common that, that, that we can either um, see the change happening. So in, in this co-create assessment we're building, we talk about change, we talk about creativity, we talk about collaboration, right? The three legs to that stool, the three pillars, the three critical components of it. And change is an interesting one. I think we all see change all around us, right? So uh, 10 years ago, if I told you you'd be laying in bed looking at a piece of glass mm -hmm. and on that piece of glass, you could get all the information you wanted, buy anything you wanted, read all your news, you'd think I'm crazy. But that's exactly what, what we all do now with our, with our tablets, right? Um, uh, so, or, or you remember our parents telling us never talk to strangers or certainly get in a car with a stranger? Well, have you, have you used Uber lately? I mean, so um, change is all around us. And, and we can either notice it, we can notice it and start to bring that conversation into our companies, or we can notice it, bring it into our companies and start integrating it into our products or services. So uh, more and more, I, I'm changing a part of my business model to one of a subscription just because more and more people are used to that subscription-based software, subscription-based technology. I don't want to install anything. I don't want to implement anything. I just want to use it. And when I'm done using it, I may cancel that subscription or I no longer need it, right? Mm -hmm. So minimizing the friction, right? These are all the things that we see all around us on a regular basis. And as, I, as you were kind enough to mention in the book, I talk about you either going to see it start to discuss it, start to bring it in and incorporate it into what you're doing or you're just going to see other people do it to you and you wonder why did I lose that account or opportunity or really the market window to, to really build something and, and be relevant in what's happening all around me. I mean, that's incredible advice. And for the small business owners watching this, uh, you know, to be able to access expertise from all over the world 
uh, and be able to really go back to their desks as soon as they watch this and start implementing and, and changing the way they do things, looking at the way they do things, and uh, hopefully seeing that, 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 that exponential growth coming as they start to implement some, um, some good changes for their business. Yeah. And, and again, my, my, uh, my comment to your, your audience is, again, I, I, like, I like things in three. One, there's money in these notes. Right, so if you if you've listened to it and you've captured some ideas, there's money in these notes. Two, I don't know about you. If I don't put it on my calendar, it doesn't happen. So start to as busy as you are, start to earmark some time to just think. And it's very difficult for you to think about your business while you're in your business. So if you can disengage from it, it really helps you think about what you're doing, why are you doing it, where you're going. Number three, you don't have to do it all by yourself. There are no new problems. There are no new challenges. The only new problems or challenges or even opportunities are the ones you haven't thought of. So proactively seek out others that can really bolster you, that really can